This is PS Audio's Perfect Wave Direct Stream DAC. Now a friend of mine lent it to me to check out. It's an interesting DAC because it upsamples all music to 20 times DSD. It's also interesting because it has a bridge network card available, so it allows you to network the DAC. However, as for $6,000, you know, is it really worth it? I mean, how does it compare to something like Shoot Audio's Yggdrasil and Chords Hugo 2? And does upsampling everything to 20 times DSD really sound good? That's what I aim to check out, so watch on to find out more. I'm going to start this review with an anecdote. Now, I was with some friends, uh, we were all meeting up and we were staying at a hotel. And at the hotel, we were, a couple of us were downstairs in the lobby waiting for a friend to come out of his room. He was a bit late. So I was saying to my friend, you know, let's go up to his room and uh, you know, I know which room he's in. I'll knock on, his, we'll knock on his door and see what's up with him. And the lady at the front desk overheard us and said, oh, I can call up to your room. What's his name? So we gave him his name and she called up to the room. He said, she said, oh, excuse me, sir. Uh, we've got a couple of gentlemen waiting downstairs for you. Would you like me to send them up? And she, and she suddenly got a frown on her face and she looked at us cautiously and she said, he said, why would you do that? And we just burst out laughing. She thought we'd be angry. But if that particular thing, that particular thing he said stuck in my head. And when I thought about the direct stream DAC, when I heard it upsampled everything to 20 times DSD, that expression just popped into my head. It was like, why would you do that? And that's kind of set the, the tone for the whole review because it's an odd choice to upsample everything to 20 times DSD. And it's an interesting DAC to start with. So as things go, it's got some kind of really cool features. Now, in terms of output or input and output on the back, you have a couple of I2S ports, you have USB, uh, you have coax and uh, AES inputs. So you've got a, your usual variety of inputs. You can also get the network bridge allowing you to connect it up to a network. And if you want MQA, you need the network bridge as they've installed the particular MQA software on that bridge rather than changing the firmware of the DAC itself, which is what companies like IFI did, which cost them a lot of uh, effort because they had to reprogram everything from scratch pretty much. However, so in that it's got, you know, that's kind of a pretty cool feature set. Now the I2S is an interesting one. It's become popular lately. Now I2S was a connection that goes between usually components inside a DAC. Connections such as AES or SPDIF, you know, you have a positive and negative. You only have kind of one connection going on there to, which transmits all the data with information telling it when you know when something starts and when something stops and and but with i2s it se separates out the actual data from the digital clock into separate wires now it's, it was, again it's something that was used inside dax and became popular to use as an external connection because people believe they could get a more reliable uh, digital transmission rather than through something like SPDIF, which has to be converted to I2S inside the deck. Likewise, USB, which was not originally intended to be used as kind of a very direct audio connection, but was kind of, or USB audio was kind of an afterthought. So for me, I hooked it up using SoundAware's D300 reference, primarily using I2S, but I did also try the USB. I didn't try the connections too much, and the reason I'll get into is because of my impressions of the sound. So I didn't go around trying to see if I could improve it too much. But you know, this is a $3,000 upgrade over, say, the USB input. But as things go, probably networking audio is a kind of uh, a big thing these days. Uh, networks, networking audio itself. Well, network connections themselves are isolated. Actually, we saw that Shit Audio took the idea of isolation used in networking audio, actually used uh, network isolators on their Generation 5 USB to improve the USB input and block noise. And similarly, uh, network audio can block noise and it allows you know, the creation of dedicated streamers such as this D300 reference that mean that uh, you can completely isolate out any issues with the transport and build a dedicated high quality transport with a high quality output. And my experience with some DACs is means that can make a very useful improvement over the uh, just plugging directly into a computer. In terms of functionality though, well, it's got a quite a neat setup. It has the functionality is entirely controlled through this front screen. There's also a very funky remote control that comes with it. This remote control not only allows you to control the DAC, like select the inputs, 
but it also allows you to control other PS Audio components, not just, uh, including the power plant if you have one, and I have a power plant, so you could actually switch on your hi-fi system and control the inputs and, and everything through this one remote control. So I think that's a really nice idea of PS Audio to create that. For functionality, you do have a volume control, which I'll just show you with the remote. And even when it, if you're using it up close, it doesn't uh, pop up these. You can just touch the screen and change the volume as necessary. But remotely, of course, if you've got it sitting in a rack far away from you, it usually uh, shows the volume with big characters so that you can see it clearly from a distance, which I think is really neat. Not so useful for me sitting with it next to me on my desk, but thoughtful idea all the same. Input, of course, you just can, not only can you select the input, but you can also rename the inputs as required by touching on the screen. So that means, you know, if not, it doesn't just become, you know, coax input or I squared S input, but you can actually name them with the transport you've got so that you can clearly delineate them when selecting them and see on screen which one you have selected. Although if you're selecting them with the remote control, it's kind of hard to see at a distance. It doesn't show clearly on the screen which one has been selected. So that's kind of one thing they could have improved on as well. However, it is, if you probably already noticed, can act as a pre-amplifier. So that means you can plug it directly into a power amp and use it that way. However, there's been one problem that has come up is that the output voltage of the RCA and XLR outputs aren't that high. Now the normal output maximums of RCA and XLR are usually two volts and six volts respectively. However, the output of uh, the direct stream is 1.44 volts as measured by stereophile and about 2.85 volts from the XLR as measured, also measured by them. That's kind of low, and I really noticed it plugging it into something like the uh, Master 9 or Master 10. They have, of course, their own volume controls in there, but I had to turn them up quite a bit more to, say, either compare them with another DAC or just in listening in general, and so that was kind of a surprise. With some amps that may be the output voltage may be too low, and you may be sitting very high in the volume range of those amps, which may be a problem if you're switching between components and the volume control doesn't change, isn't set for individual components, you could end up blasting your ears out. So it's kind of, that was a bit of a surprise. In terms of listening, I had two setups which I can listen with. My Audio GD Master 10 power amp to a pair of ELAC FS247 floor standing speakers. And ironically, of course, I paid less for the speakers than uh, this is worth retail. So you can happily take the fact that maybe, well, I can get a sense of depth well with these speakers and the amp. Maybe it's not quite as high end as maybe this was aimed for. But in terms of uh, listening for detail, I could, very, I could very easily make that out with my Focal Utopia headphones, also Hi-Fi Man Susvaras and uh, Mezes Imperians. Especially the Focal Utopias allowed me to hear clearly the sense of depth that each DAC, say the Hawkeye's Hugo 2 and Shit Audio's Yggdrasil, which I compared the Perfect Wave to, could make out in the music. Now, initially when listening with the Perfect Wave, I thought, oh, this is a nice, smooth, and very pleasant DAC to listen to music with. And that was, uh, it was from my first and last impression that it, can, especially compared to the Yggdrasil, you know, the Yggdrasil could be very lively sounding with music, but the, the Perfect Wave was kind of very smooth and easy going. And some people will really prefer this. Now, if you think about DSD, uh, you know, a few years ago, a lot of DACs were kind of just with CD quality music were a little bit harsh and sometimes digital sounding. Now, a lot of people liked DSD because it was smoother and seemed to take off that harsh edge that a lot of DAC, that a lot of uh, DACs had normally when they played CD quality music. However, I found that with more recent DACs with these sound qualities improved so much that I find even CD quality to be extremely listenable, even very especially with stuff like Chords, Hugo 2 or Shit Audio's Yggdrasil, which was specifically aimed to do give very high quality reproduction from CD quality music. And CD quality music is the vast majority of music with DSD and other formats being only very minimal in comparison. One of the things that, the problem with that uh, DSD-like reproduction is that DSD has an issue reproducing transients. And that's one of the reasons DSD can sound very smooth. Now, I'm not sure why or how upsampling all music to 20 times DSD can really change or improve on that kind of thing, but that's what the uh, PS Audio decided to do with the deck. But it still comes out as kind of very smooth, and sometimes that extra smoothness ended up being kind of unrealistic. 
Say with music that I really wanted to jump out at me, say if you hit like a drum hit, like the feeling of the impact of a drum hit. If you've actually heard drums up close, they are really loud. And the only, I've found very few actually uh, setups that can reproduce that really well. The two that I've heard, and granted I haven't heard a huge number of high-end systems, one in headphones was the RAL requisite uh, ribbon planers, which were just amazingly dynamic and came close to that. And the second was a very expensive horn speaker setup with a very expensive set of electronics going, uh, powering it. And those really had that sense of, you know, hammer, you know, the drum impact. And that was kind of, it, was, it seemed like things like drum impacts were more distant and veiled through the, with the direct stream than with the other decks. And especially when you wanted music to come out and jump out at you, it felt like, yeah, it felt like a, the, that the, the direct stream kind of overly smoothed over everything. I was just listening to some Stevie Ray Vaughan, for example, and, uh, you know, I wanted Stevie's voice. I felt like I couldn't, Stevie couldn't reach out and express himself fully to me listening to that music with the direct stream. It f felt veiled over and overly smoothed over. It felt like it was always something not quite there with the direct stream. Also with depth as well, things like Chords Hugo 2 can reproduce depth very accurately. So you have, you know, the listener and then you have the singer and then where all the instruments are around, that sense of depth comes through very cleanly. Now, with, oh, you have other DACs which have other ideas, such as the IFI DACs. The Pro IDSD, for example, has short filters that bring everything, the sound really forward. And that can be really exciting to listen to, even if it isn't quite as genuinely accurate in how it portrays, say, the, the, uh, you know, the depth of the music as, say, the chord gear. But it can be very enjoyable. However, with the direct stream, it seemed like everything was distant and it was kind of vague distant. It wasn't, like, clear. So... The worst of that I've heard DSD reproduced, and I hate to say it, was a hollow spring, which just made DSD sound absolutely flat. But, and that was, you know, not the best DSD implementation. The best DSD reproduction I've heard is the Chord Hugo 2, which makes everything sound sweet and musical, even if it can't, can't do quite as well as PS, PCM. It does make a lot of music, especially like SACD versions of a lot of old classics sound really nice to listen to. Now, the PS Audio, it just, it didn't sound flat like the Hollow Spring did, but it sounded like still everything was distant and I couldn't, it, when it needed to be near and up front and in my face, it just wasn't. And that's the issue I have with the, the uh, direct stream, is that the, the sound, I mean, a lot of people will really like this kind of mellowed out sound. I totally understand why, why it could be enjoy, enjoyable to a lot of people. Sometimes that kind of really accurate sound that a lot of decks can reproduce can be too much when people just want to kind of smooth and easy listening. The problem is with something like the direct stream in your system is you only have smooth. It's fine if that's all you want, but you can't kind of system match components to counter that. It's just once the, tra the original, like your, your source, is overly smooth, well then everything is gonna be overly smooth. Whereas if the source is a little bit kind of on the hot side in terms of, or hi-fi side, kind of bright, you can kind of balance against that and compensate a little bit, say, for example, I have the Yggdrasil and I kind of sit, think that sits dead on in the middle between stuff that sounds really warm and music, deliberately music, musical sounding and stuff that's kind of bright and hi-fi sounding. And that makes it just, you know, the perfect middle deck to give, you know, this is how it is kind of presentation of the music. Chords Hugo 2 likewise. And I balance it very slightly against a bit of, you know, careful tube rolling in the Studio 6 and it makes for a really enjoyable listen. But you can't, if it was listening to something like an overly smooth deck, like the direct stream, well, I can't balance against that. Now, I did run it, of course, through two very neutral amps, Audio GD's Master 10 for the speakers and the Master 9 for listening with headphones. And the Master 9 is... Well, both of them are kind of nothing but the facts as dead, flat, neutral, uh, uncolored as possible as far as the designer can make them. And they very much give, and, and it, I could hear clearly between all three decks when I could A, B between them by, by switching through the inputs here, you know, how the presentation was. And, you know, if you're A, being it's kind, it's kind of, you know, hard, hard to hear if you're listening to small uh, if you're listening for small details, that's good, and I could replay sections of the music. In that, I didn't find that the PS Audio's uh, DAC could actually reproduce more details than either an Yggdrasil or a Chord Hugo 2. So in that, it kind of, that kind of knocked the uh, value equation down. I mean, the value is in the fact that you can have the network bridge, which you have to pay more money for, 
and maybe some of the features with uh, the remote control, for instance. But that was balanced against the fact that the RCA and XLR outputs are too low and the fact that it just smooths over all the music too much so. So in that, I was kind of really disappointed in uh, the uh, direct stream. And it's like, as I said, you know, it upsamples everything to 20 times DSD. And really, why would you do that? It just doesn't really do it for me in terms of decks. Although some people who really like their music overly smooth may find it very enjoyable or people who just use all PS Audio components and really love the company. So once again, that's my review of PS Audio's direct stream. Thanks very much for the friend who lent it to me. Just ignore the cover on here. He's, he's wasn't sure if he was going to keep it, so he didn't bother taking the protective cover off. So that's why it looks odd. As always, thank you to everyone who supported me. If you didn't already know, these videos are supported by patrons. If you'd like to become one, it's just a couple of bucks a month and you can get my buying advice anytime. You can get my impressions of gear as it comes in. You don't have to wait for the review. You can see my reviews in advance. Comment and give me feedback directly. You can also suggest what components I review and also join our little community of people online who discuss audio gear. Also, if you did like my video, give it a thumbs up. Any questions, comments, criticism even, post below if you did do have or if try the, the direct stream and tell me what you think of it. Or if you have any other suggestions, please do post below. Don't forget to subscribe if you'd like to see more videos as well. So thanks once again for watching and I'll see you online.